Hello and welcome. My name is James Powelski, and I'm Professor of Practice and Director of the Humanities and Human Flourishing Project in the Positive Psychology Center at the University of Pennsylvania. The Humanities and Human Flourishing Project explores connections between the arts, humanities, and well-being. As a part of this project, we brought together groups of scholars across eight different disciplines in the arts and humanities, including my own discipline of philosophy, to discuss connections between these disciplines and the conceptualization and cultivation of well-being. Each of these groups was led by a disciplinary chair who helped us to assemble a diverse set of scholars and then edited a volume of essays that we published in each of these disciplines. I'm pleased to be joined today by John Stewart, who is Arts and Sciences Distinguished Professor of Philosophy and American Studies at Emory University. John, it's great to have you with us. Thank you, James. Good to be here. So, John, I wonder if we could start on a personal note. And could you tell us about a time when your involvement in philosophy contributed to your well-being? Sure. Um, I think that my involvement with philosophy uh, was stimulated by an experience actually before I really got into philosophy. I was a high school student and I was a good student and I had a summer job and I saw a kind of path stretching out in front of me. Uh, and I saw various kinds of demands and ways of meeting them. And there was something that didn't seem to be enough about that. And I came across Emerson's famous essay, The American Scholar where he talks about how each one of us individually can have an original relation to the universe, how we can make meaning and have valuable lives. And this was really transformative for me. And it made me think about success, not just in materialistic terms, but in terms of what it is to lead a flourishing life, to have a life well led. That's really powerful. Um, when we think about the, the project of the humanities and human flourishing and connecting up the various disciplines with the conceptualization and cultivation of well-being. What can you tell us about the discipline of philosophy and how it can help us to understand well-being more deeply? Right. Well, I think that the notion of flourishing or well-being is at the heart of philosophy. As, as you know, uh, philosophy is a Greek word that means love of wisdom, right? And so uh, it's not, a, as I like to say, it's not a logi field. It's not a field of knowledge. It's a field that loves wisdom. And so, um, Aristotle said we study ethics not to know the good, but to live well. So this notion of how one should live, what kind of person should somebody be each day is really at the heart of philosophy. And so philosophy brings, I think, uh, to each one of us um, a set of observations made over long periods of time by very bright folks, uh, some of which will seem foreign to any one of us, some of which will resonate. And I view it as um, an exercise in imagination. Um, these people are giving me ideas that I hadn't thought about before, some of which will not be immediately relevant and some of which I can incorporate into my life. So I, I think of philosophy as a kind of uh, greatest hits of thoughts on what makes a life worthwhile. So has philosophy figured this out? I mean, can you give us like the 10 tips uh, of what well-being is and how to achieve it? No, I don't think that, uh, you know, yes. Uh, no, you can't do that, I think. But I think that what uh, you get from philosophy is two things. One is you get a series of skills, right? So I don't think that somebody else can figure out for you what a flourishing life is. I think that that is something that you have to do for yourself. Philosophy can empower you through certain kinds of critical skills, certain kinds of analytical skills to do that well, right? And then it gives you a series of examples, and we all, uh, pick, uh, you know, bits and pieces and make them part of our own moves and then hopefully add a little bit creatively of our own. So when you think about those skills of um, understanding various elements of, of well-being and how to put those together, what is the value of uh, understanding what various philosophical thinkers have contributed over the course of history? Mm -hmm. I think that it's primarily a way of enlarging one's life and enlarging the meaning of one's life. Uh, you know, as you know, I think of philosophy a bit like uh, learning another language or traveling to a foreign country. 
Uh, it allows you to see where you live in a different way. And, and when one learns another language, you know, don't simply learn that language, but you then have a different relation to your own. And so I, I think of philosophy as essentially an imaginative enterprise, a way of telling you, have you looked at things this way? You know, hmm, that's interesting, right? And you may not stay there, but it gives you a new sense of how you do look at things instead. So you're a professor, you teach philosophy classes. When sure. you teach philosophy classes, do you see this as a matter of imparting knowledge to your students about the field, or do you see it in some more kind of a, an engaged or practical way? Yeah, more the latter. I mean, uh, I think that we all think that we impart some knowledge, at least on good days, right? But I don't think that philosophy is a matter of knowing 10 things about Aristotle or being able to hold a cocktail party conversation about Kant. That, that is really unimportant, right? And what's more important is, um, again, I think not the content, but the skills. It's a way of thinking. It's a kind of, um, the notion of philosophy as love of wisdom in a way is philosophy is the art of living, I think, right? And so it's what skills do I need in order to be able to do that well? How, how do I learn skills of analysis? How do I learn skills of critical thinking? How do I communicate? How do I deal with views other than my own? How do I assess competing, contested, often opposed values? Those are the kinds of things that I think philosophy gives. And so developing those skills by whatever knowledge base is what's really important, I think. Right? So I don't think that any one text is the key thing to philosophy. You could teach an ethics class with all kinds of different books, but the key is to develop those kinds of skills. Now, if we think about philosophy in the ancient Greek context. As you mentioned, Aristotle's mm -hmm. interest was not just in knowing about things, but also in becoming better people when, right. when it comes to ethics. And there was a, a perspective of I think philosophy was a way of life. It was a yes. way of living. Yeah. Um, in the academy today, philosophy has often become something different. Is, is Can you speak a little bit about that and about what that might do to our quest for well-being? Sure. I think that um, the... Uh, I think that the humanities more generally, and not just philosophy, but, but certainly philosophy, uh, suffer a bit by the way in which they are pigeonholed in the university. So I think they become, uh, they get treated as if they are specific bodies of knowledge, and students are to learn the following 10 or 12 or 15 facts, right? And uh, it's unclear what knowing those things has to do with anything about life. They can easily seem irrelevant and unimportant and maybe just a kind of luxury window dressing on, you know, uh, for people paying expensive tuition, right? And, and uh, so I think that rather than thinking of it in terms of a specific domain of knowledge, it's, it's better to think about it again as um, a way of engaging life that is self-critical, right? The, you mentioned ancient Greece, the, 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 the famous Socratic slogan of know thyself, right? So it's a kind of self, it's an exercise in kind of self-reflection of taking stock in oneself, of affirming what seems worthy of being affirmed and of making changes when not. So I think that the university notion of philosophy is, uh, you know, it's, it's mixed in terms of value. And the other thing I would say is I think that uh, philosophy in a broader sense is not optional, meaning you cannot study philosophy. That you can certainly do, right? But everybody has a philosophy in the way that you live your life, in the way that you act, in the sort of person that you are. You express a certain philosophy. It's not possible not to have one. You have a kind of vision. It may not be articulate. It may not even be self-conscious. But your life expresses a philosophy, right? And I think the more that we reflect on that, the more we're self-critical about it, the more it's informed by knowing how other people live and how they think, right? the greater the flourishing. Terrific, yeah. yeah. So, John, you served as the disciplinary chair for the philosophy group mm -hmm. in the Humanities and Human Flourishing Project. Can you tell us what interested you about this project, why you thought it was important to be involved? Well, I think that, again, I think that a notion of flourishing is really at the heart of philosophy. And I think that um, one of the things that's really important is to think about what that means in a pluralistic global world, right? And so when there are different perspectives, sometimes contested perspectives, what does it mean to try to bring people together who have different points of view, not to reach a complete agreement, but to at least hold views in light of understanding other points of view. So one of the things about this project that was attractive to me was the ability to assemble people who had overlapping but really different approaches, right? And who, who thought about this in terms of the world that we live in today and who thought about this in terms of um, 
economic inequalities and racial and ethnic differences and gender issues and so on, and were, in a sense, pluralist, did not necessarily think that there was one model of flourishing for everyone, right? which I think has sometimes been a problem in philosophy. It's been overly universal. It's, this is the good life, parentheses, for everyone. Probably not, right? There's different kinds of people. Yeah, so what do you do to the question uh, or the concern that flourishing is really only about people who have achieved a certain level of privilege. So you have to have a certain socioeconomic status, you have to have a certain family background or a certain position or status in your in your society. Is, is, is flourishing just limited to those folks? Uh, no, but I think that that's a, I think that's a, there's something to that criticism, right? And so if you are uh, starving, <laughs> If you are hungry, if you don't know where your next meal is coming from, if you are sick, if you are abused, um, if you are torn from your family, as so many people in the world are today, it's hard to think about uh, questions of, well, how will I flourish? There's something that seems sort of mean-spirited about that, right? And so it is a kind of luxury to think, I'm not in a, in a position of immiseration and suffering. How can I be more fulfilled? Right, so I, I think that there is a spectrum, right? But I don't think that there's a kind of neat break between now I'm not bad and how do I become good, right? And I think the important point is a kind of melioristic one for anyone, how is it possible to flourish more and more, right? And so that does raise other kinds of questions. And so again, if, if, if folks are starving, right, it's hard to talk about flourishing. And so that follows, in my mind, that anybody concerned with flourishing would be concerned with issues of poverty or with issues of class, right? And so it's not, it's not one or the other, but, but ideally to sort of think about what social practices and institutions would get people to a place where flourishing is possible for them. We don't live in a vacuum. We live in a set of social practices and institutions and relationships with others, some of which uh, make it very difficult to flourish, some of which encourage that. And so how can we have more of the conditions that make possible individual flourishing, which I think for lots of people in this country and in the world today is very difficult. I mean, nearly impossible. They're, they're in such desperate straits that it's really hard to talk about your goal today should be flourishing. No, your goal should be getting through the day Right. But I think from a from a larger standpoint, the question is then what kinds of social conditions contribute to the flourishing of individuals in those societies or in those social groups? I want to ask you about the question of individuals versus the group. Okay. So sometimes people also think about human flourishing as being just just about an individual mm -hmm. uh, and um, see that as, as separated out from one's larger community or the society. What are your views on that? Yeah, I think that that's a mistake, right? And I think that at some deep level, we all experience that as a mistake. We all recognize that our well-being in part is a function of relationships that we have with other people. Um, and so whether that's family or neighborhood or citizen, right? And so I think that it's, you know, worth thinking about um, for example, to what extent is it possible for someone to really flourish more and more fully if one lives in a racist or sexist society, right? And those are social relations, not necessarily one's own life, right? And so I think that questions of individual flourishing are very intimately tied up with questions of social justice. Right? I don't think that they're separate. I think that an individual's well-being is tied up with the well-being of the social environment in which, you know, folks live. So, John, you served as the uh, disciplinary chair, uh, mm -hmm. meeting with this group of scholars, and as well as the volume editor. What are your hopes for this volume? So, my hopes are that it will prove useful, uh, not just to scholars, uh, not just to professors and their students, but that either directly or indirectly, it will provide uh, use to folks who are thinking about how they can lead more fulfilling, more meaningful, more purposeful, more moral lives. Um, that will require a certain kind of dissemination of these ideas. We do that every day in the classroom, but there are other ways to do that in public forums as well. Do you see an opportunity for other scholars to take up these questions of connection between their work and philosophy and well-being? Sure, yeah, and so I hope they'll interact with it and write, and, and for scholars that happens in two ways. One is they may use some of these materials to teach, right, which would then reach other groups of students and other generations of students, right? And then through their own work, they can take some of the insights that I hope we put forward and develop them further, right? So I, ho I hope that it's part of a 
I, I hope that it's kind of an early stage of a research program that others will take up. So finally, let's talk about the classroom, sure. uh, which is a, obviously an important point of contact yeah. that philosophers have uh, with their students. How has your involvement in this project influenced your thinking as, a, as, a, as an instructor in the classroom? Sure, and let me, uh, let me say one other sort of prefatory thing. I think that it's important that we not think of education just in terms of the classroom. Right, and so this is a, a well-known pragmatic point, right? And so if you think about education in terms of what are those institutions that produce habits, then the school is just one of them, right? And uh, we're in schools and I'm happy to talk about that, but I think it's also useful to sort of think about what are the educational messages that are being delivered by churches, by museums, by the government, by neighborhoods, right? So uh, in, in terms of the classes, what I see is a, uh, pent up hunger by students who want to think about these issues. Um, I teach a class on ethics and flourishing and there aren't enough seats in the room. And uh, I think that what this shows is that uh, there are a lot of young people as they look ahead to their lives are trying to think about what sort of life should they live and they would like some resources and help in that. Right? And so I think that this is a real opportunity to think about the ways in which the humanities have a, a real kind of practical payoff in the lives of students, you know, far beyond their time in college. Well, thank you so much, John, sure, for having joined us today. And thank you for the terrific work you did as the disciplinary chair of the philosophy group. Thank you. And thank you for having joined us for this discussion. We look forward to having you back with us as we continue our conversations about connections between the arts, humanities, and human flourishing.